All right, what is up? Welcome on in. Monday morning, Locked on Syracuse podcast. Tim Leonard here with you. After some busy news over the weekend, Cole Swider is turning pro, signing with an agent. We'll have immediate thoughts on what that means for next year's roster, whether Cole can make it in the NBA, and then we will dive into guessing what next year's starting five is going to be because it feels like we kind of have a sense of what next year's roster is going to be. The Judah Mintz news has happened. The Cole Swider news, Frank Anselm stuff has happened. So we'll dive into the rotation and the starting five for next year. Give our best guess of that. It's all coming up on the Monday Locked On Syracuse podcast. Our Locked On Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Another week of the Lockdown Syracuse podcast. Happy you could join us and happy you could make us your first listen. Every single weekday, we are here with you guys. Monday through Friday, your only place for daily SU pods. And this episode of Lockdown Syracuse is brought to you by Stat Hero. Stat Hero is reshaping the way that you play fantasy sports. Dozens of house based games to play daily. No sharks, no funky props, just your skill versus the lineups you choose. Sign up today at stathero.com backslash locked on. So we'll begin with the Cole Swider news, then we will get into projecting the starting five today. And hello to anyone watching on YouTube, just myself, Tim Leonard, today. Subscribe to the page on YouTube if you haven't already. All our episodes are up there. Also check us out on Twitter at LO underscore Syracuse. So Cole Swider has turned pro. I think Tyler and I were sort of in difference of opinion on whether he was coming back or not. I think I said something like 60, 40 or 70, 30. I think he is going to leave. Tyler was kind of thinking, oh, maybe if it's taken this long, he will come back. I sort of expected it, but it's also kind of nice to get the news now. And he's moving on. He's signing with an agent. So we'll see what that means for Cole Swider's future. I don't really know if he has the quickness defensively to per se, play in the NBA, but I do think he could have a very nice overseas career. And as we talked about when we did the Cole Swider recap podcast, which was, I think, about a week and a half ago now when we did all our player exit interviews, as we called them, and Cole Swider was a true exit interview, actually. His numbers were really solid last year. He had 14 points, seven rebounds per game, ended up shooting about 40% from three, And when you think back on Cole, I was thinking, what will his legacy be? Sort of a tough question that we danced around and discussed in that podcast as well. It feels like he's just part of this new era now where there's these transfer portal guys that come in and we hardly really get to know them, but they play a year and then they leave. Alan Griffin feels pretty similar because there are some parallels there. Alan Griffin, known as a shooter at Illinois, didn't play a ton. Power conference, good program just didn't quite have the playing time he was looking for, moves over to Syracuse. Alan Griffin's career, though, the difference is it ended on a down note. Well, the team ended on a high note, and they made that Sweet 16 run last year. He wasn't an integral part of that. Coach Swider was playing his best basketball of his Syracuse season at the end. He scored 36 points against UNC. And say what you want, but I do think that game will be remembered. And when we look back on this forgettable season that frustrated a lot of fans, that'll be a memory. I know they lost the game to UNC, but I went through. There's only been 10 guys in the ACC era, so since 2013, that have scored 30 points in a game for Syracuse. Now, a couple guys have done it multiple times, but Cole is one of those 10 guys. I'll give you the full list here. Guys to score 30 points in a game in the ACC era one time have been Trevor Cooney, Rakeem Christmas, Mike Benajay, John Gillen, who scored 43 points in the NC State game. That's the most points scored in an individual game by an individual player in the ACC era when John Gillen scored 43 in that overtime win at NC State. Kind of similar, right? Like John Gillen also in that tier. Andrew White, who has actually scored 40 in a, on a senior day game and scored 30. So he's done it twice. He's also on the list, but the guys to do it one time to finish that list, Elijah Hughes, Joe Girard did it, scored 30 
against NC State at home as a freshman, a game that Elijah Hughes did not play if memory serves right, and then Cole Swider. So other guys to score 30 points in an ACC game in this new era for Syracuse. Buddy did it four times, Battle did it four times, and then Andrew White, like I mentioned. I remember being at that senior day game for Andrew White. I believe they played Georgia Tech, and he was definitely cooking. That was the NIT team, though. So I think it's an odd thing because – as Cole Swider has been very open about, the season team-wise did not go according to plan. And we all know that. And it's kind of like Andrew White. It's kind of like John Gillen. I think John Gillen and Andrew White had more splash moments than Cole Swider. But at least Swider's career, and I say career, his season at Syracuse finished on an upward trajectory for sure. I look back to kind of evaluating, did he have a good season? Was it successful? Will he be remembered as a positive? And I feel like the tough part with that, he just started out so shaky because I think he was asked to do too much out of the gate and expectations for him were too high. If he was paired with a forward that wasn't Jimmy Beheim and was someone, and he was just on a team that had a more diverse skill set, I think he would have been more remembered as being an integral part of a better team. But He was just another body that did kind of the same stuff on a team that didn't gel well together because of that. So it's going to be interesting to see what is Cole Swider's legacy remembered as. I I think that's a tough one because he only played a year, so he probably doesn't have much of a legacy. But best of luck to him. He's moving on. He had a good quote. I'll read you from an SI.com article chatted with, I believe, Mike McAllister, who wrote the article. So give credit to him. You can check out that article on the SI fan nation site if you haven't already, but this was when he was asked by Mike McAllister, how close were you to coming back to Syracuse? And it did take him some time to make this decision here. He says it was a very strong consideration this year at Syracuse has meant everything to me and my family. It's been a wonderful year. The fans have been unbelievable, even though we didn't have the season we wanted to have playing for coach Beheim and GMAC and all the coaches playing in the dome was a dream come true for me. The urge to come back and win and make the tournament and do all those things was a very high possibility for me. But after hearing the feedback I heard, I made it hard. I made it, it made it hard not to sign with an agent and going pro. So that was Cole Swider to Mike McAllister in that SI.com article. I think he's probably at the best point of his career to try going pro. He's not going to get drafted. It's kind of like Alan Griffin last year, again, to compare the two. Different skill sets, obviously, but, you know, Jim Beheim always likes to throw out the take of, well, defense isn't what the NBA looks for, and that's why the 2-3 zone doesn't have a factor on where our guys get drafted. I do, th- I agree with a lot of Jim Beheim takes. Don't really agree with in this era that NBA scouts and NBA executives are not focused on defense. I think it's a lazy college basketball fan take to I get it like if you watch the NBA occasionally you think oh they don't play a lick of defense compared to college but once it gets to the playoffs and once they're evaluating rosters and the good teams are trying to figure out all right who do we have in our playoff rotation defense is a huge part of that matchups is a huge part switchability Cole Swider as we saw at Villanova more in that system when he got switched on Villanova's system that switches on everything kind of got exposed because of his quickness does have some good length and he can shoot it. So I think there's going to be a role for him as a professional player. He had a nice end to his Syracuse season and we'll sort of talk about what it means now that he has gone and evaluate the roster as it stands now. But before we do that, I want to tell you about stat hero, because I know a lot of you have maybe had your bracket already been busted. The national championship game is tonight and a fun way to get in on the action and make some cash still is by going to Stat Hero and playing their Stat Hero NCAA single game pickums. It pits the star players against each other, an amazing hybrid between fantasy and sports gambling. You can take control back from those handicappers that always seem to have the advantage. Start focusing on the players you know best with the gameplay that doesn't rely on big spreads, long odds, or funky props. Stat Hero gives you the advantage, resulting in their games winning four times more often. Why? Because Stat Hero eliminates the mystery about who or what you are going up against. In addition to the Pick'em games, they also have dozens of lineups you can come through to take on head-to-head. The simple, sleek gameplay will have you playing in minutes. This is what daily fantasy 
was meant to be. Sign up for free right now at stathero.com slash locked on. Use promo code locked on for a 100% deposit match. That's stathero.com slash locked on. Use promo code locked on for a 100% match. Stathero.com slash locked on. Promo code locked on. Terms and conditions apply. All right, so the starting five next year, this is where it gets really fun. There's nothing I love more than a way too early look at the starting five or rotation. I, I've got a notes page on my laptop, and I could probably give you a stab of the 2024 starting five, just because even though it's silly now in the transfer portal era, it's a fun exercise, and it's always something that gets my brain going. And as a deep Syracuse fan, I'm sure some of you listening might relate to this. But we now have lost three starters and three of our top four scorers from a bad basketball team. Now the case to be made is that next year's roster, as we'll get into is going to have much different strengths and much different weaknesses, and it's going to gel together better. It's tough though, to lose three of your top four, three point shooters as well. It's going to be a different makeup. I think when you think about what Syracuse basketball is going to be next year, will we see some man to man? Will we see some zone? I mean, of course, we're going to see some zone, but will we see actually finally some man to man, as Jim Beheim has hinted at? I do think they're getting back to the DNA with the roster that I'm about to lay out and the starting five I'm about to lay out of Tyus Battle, Frank Howard teams, which is kind of sad. But looking back on those teams, I, I miss them, even though they weren't that good for Syracuse standards. They had good defense. They had the win over Michigan State because of defense in the tournament. They had length at the top of the zone. That's my only concern, really, when I think about how much zone, how much man are they going to play next year. The top of the zone, no matter who you put, Judah, Joe, Symeer, you can make case Kadir Copeland. I guess he's 6'6", so, so that kind of negates what I'm saying. But unless Copeland is an integral part of your rotation – which given that Mintz, Gerard, and Saimir are going to take a lot of minutes, it's sort of hard for me to visualize Copeland playing somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, 30 minutes next year. We'll see. Someone might surprise from this class, and again, this whole exercise could get thrown out the window based on transfer portal and stuff like that. Doesn't seem like they're overly aggressive. Maybe the will add a Quincy Ballard, which we can get into later in the week. But the top of the zone height is not going to be desirable, I would say. Now, Watching Judah Mintz, I do think he has some length. I think Samir Torrance has some ability as a defender. But when it was Gerard and Torrance in the Duke game, I do think Jim Beheim went to Torrance at the forward position and mixed in some different defensive looks, partially because he realized, man, 6'1", Joe Gerard, Torrance is listed at 6'3", feels generous. That's not exactly how I draw it up at the top of my 2-3 zone. That could be a trouble spot for guys shooting over it. Just guys getting passes down low, all that stuff. So that's going to be an interesting dynamic. That's one part that I think is being overlooked is the top of the two, three zone height is still not great. Even though they have more defenders on next year's team, it's a lot of new unknowns that have to learn the system. So I'm optimistic. The defense definitely gets better. Look, it was 200 something in Ken Palm last year. How much better can it get is the question. Is it really going to be at the point where, we're watching a Syracuse basketball team that is defensive-minded versus offensive-minded. And we get into that over the course of the week. Here's my best guess at the starting five next year. Judah Mintz starting at point guard, 6'3", 165. I think he could be coming off the bench. That really could go to Symir or Mintz, but I believe Mintz was probably given a sales pitch, something to the effect of, We really need a starting point guard. We really need a guy that can score on the perimeter, but also can play off ball. You could be our guy. You can play lots of minutes, and that's why we're persuading you to pick Syracuse over DePaul. Joe Girard, two guard. That's an obvious one. He's definitely starting. Jesse Center, you can pencil him in. The forwards is kind of interesting. I believe Benny will be a starter, no doubt. Forwards are pretty thin, though. It's very young. It's not the typical... Syracuse forward combination that we've seen where we've usually had one or two veterans the past couple of years. So Benny, I think will slot in at one of those, the last forward spot. I would guess right now it goes to Chris Bunch. He's six, seven, he's one eighty five. He brings you some three point shooting that you would need in the starting lineup. 
And frankly, there's not a ton of other options. Justin Taylor off the bench could be a guy that I could see playing in the forward spot because usually Jim Beheim's tendency is I'm going to play four forwards and I might play three guards, but I'm going to play four forwards. Didn't do that as much this year, but he always says he loves to have four forwards. Right now, what I see at the forward position outside of Bunch and Benny is Malik Brown, John Bullajac, Justin Taylor. So is one more going to play outside of Bunch and Benny? Is two more going to play? I mean, it kind of depends on how good is Chris Bunch. Is he a guy that you're saying, you know what? You've earned it. 30 minutes. That's our best bet. We're just going to give you the ball. You're one of those freshmen that is a starter with a long leash. Could see that happening based on how the rotation is. So I'll say the starting five one more time. Judah, Joe Girard in the backcourt. Chris Bunch, Benny, Jesse. That's my best guess. You could make a case that maybe it's uh, Symir at the guard spot. Maybe they add a transfer portal forward and that changes it up. But I think that's pretty much what we're going to have next year. That would be two freshmen, one sophomore in Benny, and two seniors. And it is a young roster. Like the bench guys then to sort of try and piece together the rotation. Symir is definitely going to play. So that's six, definitely. Justin Taylor, I would say, feel pretty confident given that shooting might be needed next year and his pedigree, his rankings, and his ability to play potentially, we'll see, forward or guard. He's 6'6", 200. I feel like at that size, that's pretty comparable to an Elijah Hughes type or a guy that could slide back and play in the forward position of the 2-3 zone. Eighth guy, I guess you would say Copeland who's 6'6", 175, and provides a different dynamic at the top of the 2-3 zone. I'm sure there's a lot of fans that would love for him to definitely be playing. The only reason why I'm I'm hesitant to even say his name is just because of Jim Beheim's history. We do this every year where it feels like there's 9 or 10 or 11 guys to pick from, and then usually 7 guys play, not even 8. So that's why I'm trying to pick this from, all right, what is Jim Beheim going to do? Less, I, I would play Copeland probably a good amount of minutes and I would use the bench more if, if I was the head coach. But I think for Jim Beheim, in knowing his track record, you're probably looking at Torrance Taylor Copeland off the bench. Odd man's out. Then that kind of leaves Malik Brown. Will he find a role? He is a forward. He's six, nine, two, ten. I, I think he could surprise me. He's been playing some really good basketball at the end of his high school career. So before people get in the comments and say, You got to, you're sleeping on Malik Brown. I totally get it. I'm also just very cognizant of the fact that Jim Beheim does not play more than eight guys. And is Malik Brown going to take out Justin Taylor? Is he going to take out Copeland? Feels hard to see right now. There might be a little bit more of a need for Malik Brown, given the size and the sort of makeup of the roster right now. Then you could also say, all right, well, who's going to be the backup center in your hypothetical rotation there? Because there's not one. And Peter Carey is really the only guy on next year's roster as it stands right now that has center tendency. I guess John Bull Jacques, he's another kind of odd man out. We've seen John Bull play the five. It feels like they've settled more into him at the four. Also don't really know if John Bull's coming back. That's kind of up in the air right now. Seems like we would have heard maybe, but He's a guy, 6'10", 216, that could be your fourth forward, kind of like he was last year in a lot of instances, especially when Benny got hurt. I I don't know. The center position is a question mark. I think they really need to add someone in the transfer portal at the center position. We'll dive into that some more. We'll guess the minutes per game of all these players and really get into the rotation and my thoughts on next year's roster, whether this is a bubble team or again or better than a bubble team based on what we have laid out and we finally have some answers to some of these roster questions but betonline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info find all of the latest sports developments including this week's masters championship odds podcast reviews for all the different leagues this season if you're listening on monday you can get in on the action for the national title game tonight make that intriguing as UNC and Kansas battle bet online is your continued source for all of your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. Head to the website today, use your mobile device, to learn more about the trends and action bet online where the game starts. All right. So the rotation minutes wise, couple thoughts on this. 
we'll go breakdown by position to make it maybe easier to follow. Guards, I think Joe Girard, 35 minutes, if not maybe slightly less, but that's his history. I, I think we can pencil that in. Judah Mintz, if he is the starter, I would say this the starting guard, whether it is Torrance or Mintz, probably looking at 25 minutes, maybe 30. I mean, maybe one of those guys just sort of supplants the other. But I view them as using both, considering they have to use three guards. And it feels to me like Mintz is not going to be way ahead of Torrance, and Torrance provides a lot that Jim Beheim used last year defensively too. He gives them a little bit more flexibility. He could play forward as we saw. Not ideal, but he could do that some. So my hypothetical, I have Mintz 25, Torrance 20. That doesn't leave any minutes for Copeland. I'm kind of viewing this as what is the ACC rotation, which I think is different from what will the rotation start out and look like. I just, I'm trying to get to what is going to be the seven, what is going to be the eight that Jim Beheim really keys in on. And things could change. Copeland could be better than people think. Mints could be worse than people think. That's all realistic. But based on what we know right now, I'm going to say that they use three guards. It's Gerard 35, Mints 25 minutes, Torrance getting 20. And I'm sure we would see mostly Gerard at the two in that instance, which Jim Bam has talked about a lot. And the fan base I know has been clamoring for for a while. So that'll be good to see. Ford's position wise and minutes wise. I'll say Benny 30, Chris Bunch 30 minutes. Feels like a lot for Chris Bunch, but again, the forward spot is kind of the area when I did this exercise where I thought, man, that's a little more thin and a little inexperienced than I would have liked. That's where if I'm adding a transfer portal guy, I I guess I shouldn't say that because the center is an obvious one, which we'll get to. You'd like to see them at a backup center and also a forward, but then you're getting into the conversation of, Well, they don't have the scholarships for that, Tim. So how are they going to do all that? So that's where it's probably unlikely that we see anything more than just a backup center, maybe a Quincy Ballard filling in that Cole Swider scholarship. And that's kind of that. Because if John Bull stays, if Chaz Owen stays, who's on scholarship, I believe you're sort of running out at that point. But I would say bench forward minutes, Justin Taylor, probably 20. And then I kind of just said, that's that on the forward minutes. Malik Brown and JBA will be in the conversation. Again, I think Brown early on will get some run, but will he be like one of those freshmen that plays six, seven games and has two points per game? That would be my best guess right now. I don't mean that as a slight to his future or what I think he's going to be potential wise. Again, I'm just basing this off of Jim Beheim plays seven, eight guys max. We know this. We've seen this for literally 45 years now, I I guess not me personally, but it feels like his track record on that subject is pretty evident. So there's no reason for me when I'm trying to guess this hypothetical rotation to give Malik Brown minutes, because I I don't think Bayheim after 45 years, is just going to start playing 11 guys in ACC play maybe early on, but not once we get into the thick of, you know, the 2023 portion of the schedule. So center minutes right now, I guess Jesse, I mean, 35, 30, and then, you know, maybe you add a backup center. That's where, do you really trust going into the season that John Bullock at the five can give you 10 minutes each night? Peter Carey at the five could be your backup and give you 10 minutes each night, or maybe more than that, because Jesse's either, go, I mean, he's going to be in foul trouble in a lot of these games, especially he's in foul trouble already, from what we know, when he plays 22, 23 minutes, sometimes he already gets there. If he's asked to play 35 minutes, hold the ball more next year, that's a scary proposition to, I I would say, basically have no backup center that you're confident in right now. Gets into Quincy Ballard, which feels like an obvious fit, the Florida State guy who grew up in Syracuse. I guess he's better than a John Bull or a Peter Carey. And it makes sense because there's a spot for him. I could definitely see it happening. They recruited him initially. Syracuse was in the initial. It feels like Simon Torrance last year, as I've said. But, I mean, yeah, I would probably add Quincy Ballard the more I think about it. It's also just not a total difference maker. It would help you a lot if Ballard develops. And I guess there's a case to be made for that more so than Carrier John Bull, at least in this year. 
But the, the center position, they need to add someone, I think. I think that's where you would use up what I believe would be your last scholarship spot. And correct me if I'm wrong on that. It's it's hard to make sense of it. I could go through, I guess. Yeah, I think that would be it because I think you're looking at 13 at that point. So anyway, Jesse, 30 minutes, 35. The rest, do you add someone or do you feel confident enough that it's Sean Bolajak or Peter Carey? And the other thing is, I think you need someone back there that if Jesse were to get hurt, it wouldn't cripple your season. I know that's not really the way to operate. And I guess last year, like if Buddy was injured in game two, then it cripples your season. And that's just how we've been risking it with the way that recruiting has been going and the talent on these rosters. But that scares me a little bit. So I would add a Quincy Ballard. I don't know if you're going to be able to get better than that. We haven't heard anything if they've reached out to Quincy as of me recording this. Maybe there's someone else. That, I mean, there's got to be someone else. There's so many guys in the portal. It feels a little bit lazy and a little bit too easy to get Quincy Ballard. So we'll see if they do add him. If they don't, though, I'd be surprised because that maybe means that Jim Beheim's saying, you know, what, we're playing man-to-man next year. And Malik Brown can can be our five in, in moments. You know, we can go small ball five with him. We can go small ball five with John Bull as our man-to-man defender. And it might actually help us in pick and roll situations and switching against certain teams. So that would be interesting. I, I think if you're playing a two-three zone, the guards at the top aren't the more I think about it, I think this roster is is a much better for man-to-man. I'm usually not the guy that's down in the dumps on the two, three zone, but I do feel like man to man is probably the way to go mostly next year, especially with some new guys learning the zone that really have to play. That scares me a little bit because we do have a lot of plus defenders. I would say on the roster, like mints has plus defender potential bunch plus defender based on his length and athleticism, but are they plus defenders in the zone or just plus defenders period? There was some good stuff this week about, uh, Judah Mintz is high school coaches talking about how he's, he's could be really good in zone and he buys into the zone when they play it. So that's encouraging. However, there's still plenty of young guys that would have to learn the zone rather quickly. It's interesting. I think next year's roster, I was looking at Bart Torvik's projection based on what they have on the roster right now, imperfect projection, but he was saying this roster would be 54th in the nation, which is pretty much firmly on the bubble. He's actually projecting based on the roster and the stats and everything that he's seen from these players that it would be about the 28th best offense next year and about the 117th best defense, which last year they were very high on Bart Torvik's offense metrics 11th. They were 153 on defense. So that kind of tells you that Bart Torvik probably there's not much he can lean on that says these guys have offensive skill set or these guys have a defensive skill set on the numbers so far. And then a lot of freshmen that he probably can't project that great. So I don't know if I'd make too much of that. I do think the idea that, Hey, we're going to have a top 50 defense and we're going to win games 55 to 52 is like, if Syracuse is good next year, that's what happens probably. But I'm not overly confident that it just clicks right away for all these new defenders. And that, I think, becomes more likely if it's man-to-man, like I was discussing. It's a lot of guys that have potential to be plus defenders. But it's still a lot of unknowns. That's that's my thing. And, you know, Jesse, I would say he's definitely a plus defender, right? But we haven't seen him a man-to-man if they go that way. Also, he's just one guy. I... You you go down the list, Gerard, I would say a minus defender. Mintz probably has plus defender potential, but it's an unknown. Benny, plus defender potential for sure. I mean, it's an easy plus compared. You're never going to put a minus next to Benny's name. You're never really going to put a minus next to Chris Bunch's name. It's just how good is that are those guys at the forward spot? Because if you're playing a 2-3 zone, experience at the forward spot is very important. And that scares me a little bit. I don't know if I'm quite as bullish on this roster as others, but you know, feel free to tweet at me. Feel free to drop some comments in the YouTube chat that proved me wrong, because I think there is a case to be made that getting back to the DNA of the Frank Howard ties battle teams is overall good for this team, getting back to defensive minded, less shooting. So that's kind of where I stand on the rotation and the starting five. 
right now. That'll wrap up the Monday podcast. We'll be back tomorrow. I think we're going to dive into the portal a little bit more tomorrow. Also, I want to dive into Judah Mintz's game. Really do a deep dive on him. There's been some interesting comments from his coaches, developmental coach at Oak Hill this week. We'll really dissect what are his strengths, what are his weaknesses, what type of role could he play next year now that we know Judah Mintz is committed. So that'll probably be tomorrow's Tuesday podcast is a full deep dive on Judah Mintz unless any other news comes out and we'll have you updated on all of those things news-wise. So follow the show on Twitter at LO underscore Syracuse, and we'll be back with you guys tomorrow on the show.